Okay, well, we are in session 14 of 16 total. Session 14, exploring the epistle to the Hebrews. And um, last time we were in chapter 12, we will go to the final chapter next week. But I thought it would be appropriate for us to backtrack and do some uh, a little groundwork here. You may recall last time we encountered chapter, near the end of chapter 12, Verse 22, it says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. He's speaking prophetically. That's where they're headed. But these are three labels for something very special, for a city. The city isn't the city that's in front of them then. It's actually an allusion to, the new, to a, a Jerusalem that's coming. And this really is a, the author's way of alluding to the messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom as we call it. And that's been all through this letter so far. In chapter 1, three times. In the first 11 verses of chapter 4. In chapter 6, with all its troubling issues that was also mentioned. Uh, it's mentioned three times in chapter 10, and of course comes up here in chapter 12 through 28. Um, and we encountered last time. I thought it would be appropriate for us to try to pull together the illusions that we made along the way and maybe fill in some others. So some of this will be review. Some of this may be new to you. The pervasive mention of the city. Jesus spoke about the city where he is now preparing a place for us. Paul spoke of the Jerusalem of God as being a city that is free and not in bondage in Galatians 4. This is the city that Abraham sought. And that was alluded to in the Hall of Faith in, in Hebrews 11. And uh, the writer will mention it again in chapter 13. So I wanted us to focus on this idiomatic use of Jerusalem in a very special way. John describes the city as the abode of all the redeemed for all time. Uh, who enter it by the resurrection at the rapture or translation if you will. And the, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, the writer uses that very interesting phrase here, which are written in heaven and to, the, to God the judge of all and to the spirits of the just men made perfect. This is a review from last time. The general assembly. The term in the Greek actually implies a festive gathering. Church of the firstborn. Strange phrase to use. This is an illusion. He's writing, to, let's, let's remember something else, very fundamental to understand this letter. This letter he's writing to Jewish Christians. These are not Jewish unbelievers. These are Jew, Jews that are justified by the blood of Christ, but that are stymied in their spiritual growth. And his whole passion from the first verse to the last verse is for them to move on to spiritual maturity. But uh, he's, he's speaking of them as the, the church or the assembly of the firstborn. That's, he's, he's, just, he's using the, the phrase the same way James does in terms of Jews being the first fruits. And, uh, the, uh, and to the spirits of just men. And it's interesting, he calls them spirits. Why? Because they're not, the ones that have passed on are not yet united with their bodies. They're in the bosom of Abraham. Uh, and because the resurrection of the Old Testament saints has not yet taken place. In fact, most scholars believe that the resurrection of the Old Testament saints isn't until the second coming. In contrast to those that are dead in Christ that raptured at least seven years, maybe more, prior to that point. So there's, those subtleties are uh, included in the, 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 the subtleties of the language here. And it should be noticed, noted then that the author here is making a clear distinction between the Old Testament saints and the church saints in, in these allusions. Wherefore we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. And this going into the fifth of the five warnings. Wherefore we. See, he, the writer is putting himself in the same category as his readers. Wherefore we. So if the writer is indeed Paul, as we believe it is, um, he's, he's putting himself in the same uh, categorization as his listeners. Receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, and so forth. Uh, the millennial messianic kingdom will give way and usher in a new order. And that's what we want to talk a little bit about tonight. Let us have grace. And again, he always hammers grace. Did you realize that Paul's the only writer that does? 
We'll talk about that, especially next time. Five major warnings we've gone through, and I'm not going to repeat the details here other than just the danger of drifting was in chapter 2, the danger of disobedience in chapter 3, failing to mature, which is the main thrust of the whole uh, epistle, but in chapter 5, the dangers of willful sin in a special sense in chapter 10, and then finally just the danger of indifference, the danger of indifference in, in his fifth warning. And the main thrust, these five parenthetical warnings are not incidental to the main theme. They are the reason for the entire epistle. And great, it, Paul's, Paul's passion is that great loss awaits those who fail to persevere. Loss of their salvation? No. Loss of reward, big difference. Loss of reward and honor in Christ's coming kingdom. We need to understand the differences. The Revelation closes, Behold, I come quickly, Jesus says, Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What's that all about? We want to talk about that tonight a little bit. So our agenda is we're going to talk, we're going to once again put in focus, so there's no misunderstanding, the paradigm of salvation, past, present, and future. What does it mean? We want to touch on eternal security and the difference between justification and sanctification, inheritance and Paul's paranoia. We've talked about these things in the past, but I think it's important to get these in focus before we move into some of the topics tonight. And you might call, if you want a title for tonight, it's Thy Kingdom Come. We sit the Lord's Prayer, right? Thy Kingdom Come. What on earth does that mean? We pray that, don't we? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Kingdom Come. What does that mean? Isn't, isn't that kingdom come already? Apparently not. What is he talking about? And we're going to talk a little bit about the Davidic covenant, an overlooked covenant by, to many. Everybody knows the Abrahamic covenant, indeed, every one of our benefits derived from the Abrahamic covenant. But the, uh, another of the unconditional covenants was the Davidic covenant. We want to understand that. And we'll talk a little bit about the kingdom events and what does it mean to be an overcomer. Rodemaker is fond of saying, I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. What does he mean? Past tense, present tense, future tense. Past tense, we call that justification. 100% done by Jesus Christ. You can't add to it. To try to add to it is blasphemy. It's a gift of God, of everlasting life, received by faith alone in Jesus Christ. That was the banner that led to the Reformation. That truth is the driving truth for all of us being justified. Our passport is stamped innocent, not guilty. We may not have changed yet, but if we've accepted Christ, we are declared guilty. We're justified. Okay? The, that, that's, that's in the past, hopefully. If anyone hasn't accepted Christ, I want to talk to you. Come see me when we're through here. Now, most of us are a work in progress. We're not, God isn't finished with any of us. And that's, we call that sanctification. That's a progressive work that involves faith and the works of the believer. We're not saved by those works. Those works testify to the fact that God is working in us and that we're in a, we're a work in progress. The future tense is glorification. And so that's a result of the previous two steps. And all believers will be glorified. That's what Roman, that's the most amazing thing about Romans 8. It's usually quoted to, to, to uh, exemplify justification. No, it's even, even glorification. We were, it, we're, we're des destined to be... Uh, uh, to, uh, to be, uh, receive a resurrection body. But not all be equal. That's the part we want to get into here. Past tense, justification, separate from, separation of the penalty of sin. You're in Christ, you have, you're no longer declared guilty. Present tense, separation from the power of sin. There's no reason for a Christian today to sin because he can call upon the Holy Spirit. The unbeliever, that's not true. He is in bondage to sin. But the believer is not. He may stumble. He may fail to invoke those resources. But that's, but the, that's, what the, that's the glorious aspect of the first seven chapters of the Epistle of Romans deals with. And the future tense is separation from the very presence of sin. And that happens after a thousand years in a special way. Present, past tense justification. Present tense sanctification. Future tense glorification. We generally, in the, in the institute, we have the students avoid using the word salvation because it's ambiguous. What do you mean by salvation? 
Well, I was saved from alcoholism last year or something. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about soteriological salvation. I was saved from a burning building. No, the salvation we're talking about here is being from the pit of hell. So there's the three past, pre, pre, past present, and future senses of salvation. Now, why am I getting into that? Because I want to anchor, without getting into a whole lengthy study here, the eternal security issue. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner, makes the sinner righteous. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin, but sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. So that's the distinctives there. Now, around this whole area, we have several views. For 400 years or more, there's been a theological war between the Calvinists and the Arminius. Calvinism is typically typified by the five points of Calvinism. Not all Calvinists embrace all five, so I won't take the time on that. The key one is this whole idea that if you're a true believer, you'll persevere to the end. And uh, perseverance thus becomes the test of reality. That's why sometimes a theologian will call this viewpoint experimental predestinarian. Yes, you're predestinated. How do you tell if you've been predestinated? Well, you wait to get to the end. If you've persevered, then you're predestinated. Well, that, that doesn't give you assurance, does it? So that's, it fails in that sense. This effectively denies the assurance of salvation because proof is always in the future. And so it's not, very, it's not satisfactory from that point of view. The Armenian goes the other way around. He says justification can be lost because he says believers are in danger of losing their salvation as a result of sinful behavior. That's their approach. And uh, so they believe that the believer's eternal security rests in Christ's work indeed and the, individual, the individual's decision to continue in faith and not fall away. So that to the Arminian, you can lose your justification. Works play a key role in retaining salvation. That means suddenly your, your eternal destiny derives from your, your works, your perseverance. And uh, now, there are, these are both strangely similar. Both views acknowledge that Christ's completed work is absolutely essential. Both acknowledge the importance of works in the life of the believer. Both... Uh, so they both are correct in what they assert, they're both wrong in what they deny. Although the direct opposition between these two views has endured for between four and five, I guess 500 years. But they both are very close to the Roman Catholic view is that, that emphasizes works as the basis as salvation. Now, so you've got the Calvinism, eternal security, but conditioned upon completing uh, the perseverance is sake, and, it's mo and this would be classified as the experimental pre predestinarians. Yes, you're predestinated, but you can't tell until you get there. Okay. Armenian, only those that persevere to the end are saved. These two views are what populate most theological libraries, supporting one or the other. There is a view between these two that is, has been widely overlooked by many authors, and that is the whole view of what we'll call the partakers or the overcomers. This view emphasizes eternal security in the sense of justification because your security in Christ is entirely in his hands and his father's hands. But there is a distinction drawn by this, this view between entering heaven and inheriting. Entering and inheriting. And, and in other words, the variation of rewards. And we're going to focus on that a little bit tonight. And just that we could spend the whole evening pulling up verses that support the eternal security issue, I'm going to just pick one pair. In John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29, Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's quite a statement. If you've accepted Christ, you are now his responsibility, is what he's saying. He goes on. He says, my father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. As you read John 10, you may miss the fact there are two hands involved. I usually like to gesture this way. Can I get out if I tried? My answer is I don't think so. And I'm going to paraphrase Walter Martin's quip that if, if you can lose your salvation, I have a new name for God. Butterfingers. That's perhaps a little irreverent way of expressing it, but it makes the point. 
If you have accepted Christ, you are now his responsibility. He's able to brag to his father in John 17, of all that you've given me, I have lost none. He makes the footnote, the exception of Judas, of course. He, uh, in fact, he, in, that, in that famous prayer in John 17, he hands that responsibility to the Father. So that's, gives, that gives rise to this view. So we're talking about justification, salvation here. If you have accepted Christ, you are secure because of what he did, 100%. You can't add to what he did. But Paul, just to take another verse with, from a different point of view, makes a very strange statement. He makes many statements like this. I've just picked one of a series. But let's, he says, Paul says, But I keep my, under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Strange phrase. Here's Paul. He wrote 14 of the work, books of the New Testament. He, uh, he wrote the book on eternal security called Romans 8 and others. What's he afraid of losing? His salvation? No. No. But lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. We need to understand what he's talking about here. Because it affects every one of us. While on the one hand we can be secure in Christ in terms of being assured of entering heaven, there is an inheritance that God has set aside for us that we can forfeit if we are not faithful. And we cl cl you know, categorize all that under a topic of rewards. Back in Hebrews chapter 3, you may recall, a very key verse. It says, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. For we are made partakers. This, in, this is a very key word. It's the metakoi in the, in the uh, Greek. The one who shares in. More than just a companion, he's a comrade, a partner in a work officer dignity. Metacoy. Are we metacoy if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end? There is an essential aspect of perseverance to the end. In other words, what this is saying that our behavior matters. Our behavior prior to being saved does not. That's been paid for, stamped, done. But from that point on, we start a report card. And there's a key word here. If. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. That's the name of the game. That's what we're going to call here shortly being an overcomer, not being overtaken. I want to talk about entering versus inheriting. If I invite you into my home, that allows you to enter my house. It doesn't allow you to rearrange the furniture. When, when Dan and I arrive in Florida tomorrow, we'll sign in in a hotel. That gives us a room, an access, a place to use, a place to be. Great. We do, I don't think we inherit the hotel, unless we're Paris Hilton or something, right? Entering and inheriting are not the same thing. Entering heaven and inheriting what's there for you are two different things. And so this is, summarizes that. Inheritance, privileges will be widely variable. Every one of us in this room that has accepted Christ, we will be together in heaven. But once we're there, we may discover a surprising divergence of benefits while we're there based on our walk. And so that's what we want to talk about a little bit. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. There's nothing, by the way, more certain than this. But what does it mean? What on earth is this kingdom is talking about here? That leads me to another set of terms that I'm going to badger a little bit because I think it's, a, it's, I have to tell you through most of my ministry, I have accepted the presumption of most commentators that there are two terms that are equivalent. And I'm reminded of a, of a situation in optics. Those of you that have had any interest in astronomy know what I'm talking about when I talk about resolving power. You get a cheap telescope and look at a star and you see a star. But you spend a lot of money and get a really good telescope, expensive telescope, and you look at that same star and you discover it's a double star. The ability of the optics to resolve two things more clearly is called resolving power. It actually follows a mathematical formula. It's a measure of quality of optics called the resolving power. The same thing is true in language. 
And there are two terms that most people think are synonyms. And that's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And you'll find most commentators assume that the writers of the Gospels use, are referring to the same thing. And I thought, I accepted that for many, many years. But suspiciously. And I, I've now come to the conclusion for a variety of reasons that these are not the same thing. The kingdom of God, of course, is everything that's outside God himself. That creation precedes the earth, the universe. Within that category is a subset called the kingdom of heaven. There are 739 references in the New Testament to heaven. Only Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. He does it 33 times. And most commentators figure, well, he was Jewish. That was just his choice. His, it was just a linguistic choice. And I've learned over my 60 years of study that I, every time, and all through those 60 years, I've come across things that I had to change my view. Had a, I learned a little more and made it a little more. Every time I've had to change my view, it's always been in the direction of being more specific more literal than before. Some say, well, that's just, well, Matthew just used that term. No, five times Matthew uses the term kingdom of God. There's one place where he uses it adjacent to each other. And some people use that, well, that proves their synonyms. No, it doesn't. It proves the opposite. He is being more denotative than his forebears. Because Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. Mark, Luke, and John, for many similar incidents, use kingdom of God. That doesn't exclude the kingdom of heaven, but, but Matthew, by being more precise, is highlighting something more specific. He uses the term kingdom seven times, and his and father's, and thy kingdom five additional times. So Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. He's emphasizing that. And one of the things that we're called to do is rightly divide the word of truth. Well, kingdom of God, what are we talking about? That's beyond visibility. It includes angels long before the earth was created, cherubim and so forth. It began prior to the earth. It's inclusive of everything God has created, plus some. Kingdom of heaven is a little different, turns out. It's physical. It has locality. In fact, we do well to note the difference between, in, in both Hebrew and German, the word of and the word from is the same word. If I'm von Habsburg, that means I'm from Habsburg, or I'm of Habsburg. This is the kingdom from heaven. And so could, and, and would probably be helpful if that's the way it was translated. In any case, it's physical. It has locality. It involves mankind only. It is a political institution. We'll see that in Daniel chapter 2. It has a capital. It's called Jerusalem. It has a palace. We're going to look at the floor plan of that palace. It was usurped. It's destined to be regained, according to Matthew 11. Back in Daniel chapter 2, you may recall that's a chapter where Daniel is interpreting the strange dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which turns out to be a metal image that represents all the different kingdoms forthcoming on the planet Earth. And Daniel not only recounts that dream, he explains what it means. Daniel chapter 2. By the time you get to verse 44, we discover that these four main kingdoms, gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron mixed with clay, that these are all going to be replaced by a new kingdom. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Clearly, Daniel understood, and his listeners understood, that was a kingdom like the predecessors. Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. These are kingdoms. God's going to set up his that's going to replace all those, right? Okay. This whole saga, as I was trying to figure out how do I summarize this in just one session, it's really a study that, that could take uh, many sessions. Psalm 2 is one of my favorite psalms. It describes a cosmic war and it lays out the whole story. So we're going to just explore briefly Psalm, chapter, uh, Psalm 2. There are four speakers. There's the voice of the nations in the first three verses, the voice of the God the Father in the next three verses, the voice of the Son in the next three verses, and then the voice of the Holy Spirit in the next three verses. 
Kind of interesting. This is actually, you, you, you talk about the Trinity. Here is, you're going to eavesdrop a conversation among the Trinity. Interesting, and we learn a lot from this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Oh, that's interesting. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You know, even as a kid when I read this, the audacity of this. I can understand the world not believing in God. I can understand the world doing all kinds of things to offend God. I could not imagine the world taking up arms against God. We're going to break their bands asunder and cast away their... Yeah. <laughs> right. So the first thing here is rage and vain imaginations against the Lord. Is, you know, that's step one. When did that start? Well, it dramatically started when they rejected the child in the manger. That became the, the presentation of the Messiah. That's reinforced from Acts 4. Acts 4, verse 24. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. They said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine? It's quoting David in Psalm 2 right here. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the, Gent with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. The rejection, of course, of Christ. Okay, so we've looked at the first three verses. Let's take the voice of the Father, who then, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Wow. The derision of the Lord, supposing that his covenant is going to be set aside. It's an allusion to 2 Samuel 7. We'll take a look at that. Very critical, unconditional covenant that affects every one of us. That he then confirms by oath in Psalm 89, verses 34 to 37. Let's just take a look at these verses. They're pivotal in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 7, verse 8. Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, God says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following a sheep, to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. Okay, so far so good. For I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in the place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused they, thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. David wanted to build a house. No, you can't do that. I'm going to build you a house, God said David. And when thy days be fulfilled... And thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for a long time. Know what it says? Forever. I think God means what he says and says what he means. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established, how long? Forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And that's what Gabriel told Mary in Luke chapter 1 verse 32. We celebrate that every Christmas, but we may not appreciate the significance of what he's saying here. This is the Davidic covenant. Promise of posterity of the house, a throne of royal authority, a king to rule on the earth, and it's certain, established forever. The throne will be reestablished. Amos 9.11, quoted in the Council for Jerusalem, Acts 15, indicates the tabernacle of David will be reestablished in Jerusalem. This cannot be applied to the church, by the way. So let's not get confused with this replacement theology nonsense. Let's take a look at Ezekiel 37, a few verses there. 
And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will, make, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they have gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Does that sound like the church to you? I don't think so. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. Wow. Four times the scripture seems to indicate David is going to rule yet in the future in Israel. Most of us presume that that's just the son of David, not David himself. Maybe, maybe not. He's been resurrected. Why couldn't he be? We don't know. I mean, there's good scholars that debate that issue. But in any case, David my king shall be over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to, unto Jacob my servant, wherein do your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children, for a long time. No, forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Their prince. Now that's interesting because when you study the temple in the millennium, it keeps speaking of the prince. Is that a title of Christ? Or is that a title of David in some subordinate role under Christ? Don't know. Good, good. Many people have speculated about that both ways. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and they will set up my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is the background of the readers of Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. So that you can understand the presumptions they're making here. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Wow. Let's take a quick look at the oath that God confirms in Psalm 89. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. God speaking. Do you think he takes himself seriously? Absolutely. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever. Whoops. I thought his seed ended at Jeconiah. Wow. Give any good Jew Jeremiah 22 verse 30 and say, what do you do with that one? Because after Jeconiah, that's the royal line, no, there'd be no one prospering after that. And where can the Messiah come from? It's got to come from the line of David. The answer, of course, is a virgin birth. His seed shall endure forever, his throne as the sun before me, and it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven, Selah, Psalm 89. Okay, well, now the Father's continuing here. He says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. What, when did this vexation start? With the fall of Jerusalem. Jesus predicted that as he rode that donkey, he wept. If you just known this thy day, the things that, been, that belong to your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Luke 19. This generation shall not pass, so all these things will fulfill, Jesus says. And in 38 years later, Jerusalem was wiped out, over a million and a half men, women, and children slaughtered by the Romans in nine months. Were any Christians there? No. Why? Because of the letter Paul wrote to the Christians. And we'll talk about that next time, some surprising discoveries. This vexation starts in 70 A.D., and how far does it go? Hosea 5.15. I will return to my place, God says. Must have left it. Until they acknowledge their offense, singular and specific. Acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. That's the purpose of the great tribulation, is to wrap this up. I'll vex them in a sore displeasure. Matthew 24.29. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Where is this king sitting? In heaven? No. On Mount Zion. The establishment of the rejected king on Mount Zion. Laid out here. Okay, let's see what he says. Let's talk a look. The, the father has spoken. Now let's see what the son says. 
I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. When did, you, when did, when did, when did God say that? Huh? At his baptism and at the transfiguration, right? And here. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Satan offered that to him in the temptation, and it was, strangely, his to offer, or it wouldn't have been a temptation. No, he went the hard way. He went by way of the cross. Praise God. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen of thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for, for thy possession. For thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That whole, those three verses are a quote by Jesus himself, alluding to the commitments that, been, that his father gave him. Okay. The subjection of the earth to his rule. Is that going on right now? You know, there are people, many good pastors, that teach that the, the church's job is to, is to subdue the, the world for the Messiah. Really. I know it sounds strange to that for our ears, perhaps, but that's what they really believe. No, that's not biblical. It's the other way around. <laughs> anyway. So here's the order we've had in Psalm 2. The rage and the vain imagination against the Lord is anointed in the first three verses. The derision of the Lord, supposing the setting aside of his covenant and his oath, which of course he won't. The vexation from 70 A.D. through the Great Tribulation, that's in verse 5. The establishment of the rejected king on Mount Zion. And the subjection of the earth to his rule. That's what we're talking about. That's, Thy kingdom come. That's what you're praying for when you pray the Lord's Prayer. Well, there's still, one, there's still a few verses to wrap this up in Psalm 2. The voice of the Holy Spirit. Verses 10, 11, 12. Be wise now, therefore, ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Save, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. The concept of kiss here simply it means homage. We're doing homage here. And uh, the, uh, um, there's a, uh, um, it's a strange use of the word bar, for, which normally means son, but Jerome and others render it to give pure, pure uh, 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 worship, is what it's really saying. And so... Uh, Psalm 1 then started with the Beatitude. Psalm 2 concludes with the Beatitude. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So we're right here trying to get our mind around the Davidic covenant. The scepter of Judah. It was promised to the tribe of Judah back in Genesis 49. David's promised kingdom was a political kingdom. David's house was a dynasty, a royal line. The, the northern kingdom, when it had the civil war, had nine different dynasties. Judah, the southern, had only one, namely the house of David. That was even emphasized, strangely, but to, to God's remarks to Abraham in Genesis 17. It was prophesied, and David was prophesied in advance. His genealogy is, we find, encrypted in Genesis chapter 38. Now, that's the book, that's the Torah, the book of Moses. Long before Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, and so on, you'll find Boaz, Ruth, uh, 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 Ishay, Jesse, uh, uh, Obed, Jesse, David. They're, they're laid out there, 49 letter intervals. Fascinating. And of course, in Ruth 4, that's what connects Bethlehem to the house of David, is the book of Ruth. It was also confirmed by oath in Psalm 132, Psalm 89, which we looked at in several places. Solomon's, David's sons, fail, by the way, okay? Jeconiah, it's a, it's a downward thing to find a Jeconiah, which has a blood curse on him. And, of course, that's how God gets around all that with a virgin birth, by going through not Solomon, but through Nathan, the second surviving son of Bathsheba, to get to the line of Mary, through whom our Messiah comes. The blood curse is on the Solomonic line, not on Nathan's line. Okay. So Jesus has a legal claim through Joseph because he is the legal father of Jesus Christ. But there's an exception in the Torah having to do with the daughter of Zelophehad, which, upon which Christ's legal claims through Joseph obtain. Mary was in the line of David and, and her father adopts her husband as his son. And that's the way that all works. That's a whole study in its own right. But the main point is David's throne itself did not exist during Jesus' time on the earth. So how is Jesus going to sit on the throne of David? He couldn't have during his ministry. What does that mean? He has yet to do so. That's yet forthcoming. 
The covenant is declared to be everlasting. It's an unconditional covenant. That's all through the scripture. You can chase these down on your own. It was confirmed to Mary by Gabriel. It was recognized by the first church council in Acts 15, where James quotes Amos 9, verse 11, in this regard. And, of course, we are praying that every time we do the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. That's what we're talking about. Now, it's interesting how the number of 12, you know, it's interesting. All of us have, how many have noticed the number 7 in the Bible? That's a number for the kingdom of God. It's interesting that the number of the kingdom of God, uh, excuse me, yeah, the, the, the number of king of heaven is always 12. It really fascinated me to realize this. There are 12 tribes in Israel, right? How many apostles are there? Twelve. And those apostles are declared that they will rule over those twelve tribes. Right? That's in Matthew 19 and in Luke 22. You'll find the same verse where Jesus says, tells them the twelve apostles. And by the way, those apostles don't include Paul. Because Paul is not an apostle to the Jews. He's an apostle to the Gentiles. That's why Paul didn't sign his letter. Because he doesn't want to step into the shoes of being an apostle to the Jews, because that was not his calling, much as, he, much as he would have preferred it. That was Peter's role. They divided it up. He, Paul went to the Gentiles. So Paul is writing a letter to those that he loves and he's concerned for, but he doesn't sign it as an apostle for that reason. But anyway, there's 12, 12 apostles. There are 12 tribes, 12 apostles. There are 12 kingdom parables. There are 12 kingdom mysteries. If you take... There are 12,000 sealed from each of the 12 tribes in Revelation 7, right? The New Jerusalem has 12 gates, 12 foundation stones, and it's 12,000 furlongs by 12,000 furlongs by 12,000 furlongs, which implies it's a three-dimensional thing, at least. <laughs> there's there's uh, 12 kingdom parables. Two of them have a very troubling remark in them. The guests at the wedding feast, the guy that didn't have the right garments, gets cast into the darkness that's outside. And most of us, me included, have read that for years, always assuming that was, well, they're set to hell. We don't realize the subject of the parable, everybody there is saved. But this guy was not authorized to attend the wedding feast. So he's cast to the darkness that's outside, whatever that means. The stewardship of the talents has that same strange phrase, cast into the outer darkness in your English. It's actually the darkness that's outside. Okay. Let's take a look, by the way, as long as we're on all this. The Millennial Temple, it's an actual temple. This is not an allegory. The description of the temple is in Ezekiel 40 through 48. It's highly detailed. It tells you the thickness of the walls and steps and all that stuff. So it's not symbolic. It's a literal temple. All nations, not just Israel, all nations will worship there somehow. Offerings and sacrifices are resumed. Boy, does that bother a lot. In fact, there's so many aspects of this temple that are non-Levitical, it almost didn't make it into the canon. The way the, the priests are dressed and the things they do are not the way they are instructed in the Levitical system. No, this isn't the Levitical system. This is Melchizedekian, turns out. Offerings and sacrifices are resumed. Why? I thought Christ died once and for all, for everything, right? They're there for the same reason they had offerings in the Old Testament. They're memorials in advance. These will be memorials after the fact. Celebrating what? The cross of Christ, strangely enough. Here's a, here's a corker. This is a disturbing thing that your Seventh-day Adventist friends will never fail to point out to you. Do you realize the Millennial Temple is not open on Sunday? It's open on Shabbat and on the new moon. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, but that's one thing they point out, that most Christians have no grasp of what the Sabbath is really all about. That doesn't mean we're shackled to observe the Sabbath. We have the opportunity to do so if we choose. The Sabbath is all about celebrating God as Creator. Anyway, moving on. If we take a look at the tabernacle, just, it's, it's the basic model for all this stuff, and in this diagram, east to the bottom, which is very typical for this sort of thing, we have the linen fence, the first thing you see. It's 75 feet by 150 feet if you use a foot and a half as an approximate cubit here. And that turns out to mean it's a, if that's basically the, the uh, length of Noah's Ark, 300. Um, anyway, if, if the, the perimeter is the same perimeter as the length, of, I don't know if you, that means anything, I just mentioned it. And if you go through the own, one door, one gate, 
you come to the altar of sacrifice and then the laver where you washed. And if you went through that properly then, and if you were a priest, not just a Levite, but a priest, then you could enter the holy place and the holy of holies. And if we take a little closer look at the basic structure of the nous, the, 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 the uh, tabernacle proper, we find that as you go in its single door, you, that's called the holy place. It has another inner sanctum called the holy of holies. The menorah is the only source of light in the place. You have the table of showbread, 12 loaves changed every Shabbat for each of the 12 tribes. And the golden altar, or more precisely the altar of incense, which is just outside of, but associated with, the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies, you've got two things, not one, two things. We always visualize one because we think of the Ark of the Covenant as having the lid of gold. No, 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 they're two separate things. And that turns out to be important if you, when you study that more carefully. The Ark of the Covenant is wood covered with gold. It's deteriorating. It's ancient. But the lid, as we would visualize it, the mercy seat is not the way it's usually portrayed. It's actually a seat and is gold. And it is visualized in both the Torah and also in Ezekiel as, as if God is sitting there. In fact, when, he's, when the high priest once a year goes through great ceremonial preparations. When he enters it that one time on Yom Kippur, he sprinkles the blood between and in front of the cherubim. And Ezekiel gives us a clue there for the soles of his feet. Anyway, uh, so there's a, a lot we could talk about that. We have a whole briefing on that if you want to chase it down. But uh, every one of the, every detail, every, every physical dimension, every material speaks of Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and tab tabernacled among us, John tells us. He says, I am the door. Anyone that comes through but by me is a thief and a robber. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. And interceding for us in Hebrews 7.25. And of course, our sin bearer and our propitiation for our sins is, is every detail. And the entire project sits on silver sockets. It rests on his blood. Silver being the symbol for blood. We go on and on. Anyway, the second temple, Herod's temple, is not the one we're seeing in Ezekiel. The one we have in Ezekiel, again, has the same, you know, styling. No, excuse me, excuse me, this, uh, this is uh, uh, Solomon's temple. You have not one table of showbread, you've got ten of them. Not one lampstand, you've got ten. And you have the, the, the expansion of, the, of the, uh, uh, the tabernacle when you get to the, the physical temple itself. And there's a molten sea and a holocaust altar and so forth. Okay. Um, the, there you have an inner court, an outer court. There are a couple of things in the temple that were not in the tabernacle. There's a place called the porch, and there's two pillars one, that have names, Yachin and Boaz. If you want to get into all of this and understand its spiritual significance, I encourage you to get my wife's book. Books, I should say, because the same model is exemplified in the way of Agape and the Be Transformed. And it also, it's prominent in her latest book, King, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory. She'll talk about the personal stories for the priests and how that's where the priests stored those things that, the unmentionables, their own little idols. And the, let's talk about Ezekiel's temple. We again recognize the same basic architecture. I'm turning it on the side because it'll be easier to talk about. I've now shifted east to the right side of the diagram. But this is pretty much the same as we're familiar with the previous one. And, uh, but we're going to add some things here. We're going to add chambers for singers. And as this thing grows, we're going to add priest chambers on either side and uh, priest kitchens. This is not symbolic. This is a real place. And uh, we have inner gates and we have chambers of the outer court and we have people's kitchens and we have outer gates. And I'm very intrigued with these outer gates because the word there for outer, outermost in Ezekiel 40, 20, for example, is the same word that occurs in Matthew 8, 12 and also in those two kingdom parables where it speaks of the darkness that's outside. It is the view of some, and I'm inclined that way myself, to regard the casting the outer darkness people who are saved, they're in heaven, but they are not qualified to attend the wedding supper. And so they're excluded 
from the central festivities at the moment. And uh, that's uh, not a view held by everyone, but it is the view held by many of the modern exegetes that I respect. The exegesis that originally got behind this was G.H. Ladd, but uh, Charles Stanley, Erwin Lutzer, head of Moody, and others have, him, uh, uh, have the same view. Most of us have a tough time. I first encountered this view uh, several years ago in, in the writings of uh, Joseph Dillon. And uh, uh, I... Uh, Dillo, I mean, Joseph, Dillo, Joseph, Joseph C. Dillo. Dillo uh, illuminated so many of these things I thought it was terrific, but I couldn't go quite this far. But since then, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, he's right. In any case, we have a holy district here that may surprise you. There's Jerusalem, but the temple is not in Jerusalem. It's almost 50 miles to the north. If you look at the holy district, it's 50 miles by 50 miles. And we have it divided with the living quarters for the sons of Zadok up there near the temple, of course, sons of Levi, and then food growing areas on both sides of Jerusalem, apparently. And then there's a portion for the prince. Who's the prince? Is that David? Who knows? We'll see. And I should mention that many good scholars have slightly different ways of rendering what they, 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 what they infer from the text itself. This is just one rendering to highlight some of the issues. Clearly, the topology of the uh, 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 ground will be very different because it will be highly different. There, there's going to be a river coming out of the temple, feeding Jerusalem, and then going to uh, the Dead Sea on the one direction and to the Mediterranean on the other. That's all described. And so, the division of the land. Take that whole thing. And we have going to the north, Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, Manasseh, Naphtali, Asher, and Dan. And going to the south. Again, we have the 12 tribes inherit the land surrounding this far greater than the present bounds of, of uh, Israel as we see it today. And um, it's my personal speculation that this may have a lot to do with Genesis, before Genesis 3. If the Garden of Eden was east of Eden, a garden was east of Eden, right? And we know that the, 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 the cradle of civilization was the Fertile Crescent. And that was east of Eden itself. The Garden of Eden was east of Eden. And Eden itself is where Israel is today. So there may be a prehistory here that will give all this a relevance that we can only guess at today. Okay. Well, you and I are looking for the Harpazzo, right? The rapture of the church. Most of us have studied prophecy know what happens on the earth. After the Harpazo comes the emergence of the world leader, maybe two of them. Then the Great Tribulation, this period of time of trouble such that the world had never seen to that time. That will be, of course, interrupted, or it climaxes in the Battle of Armageddon, which is interrupted then, of course, by the second coming. Well, that's all on the earth. Most of us make our little diagrams. You've seen mine in the past. What's going on in heaven at this time? What happens in heaven right after the rapture? Not your marriage supper? No, not yet. There's something. The next thing that happens is the judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat. Yes, and then we have the marriage of the Lamb, not necessarily the wedding supper. There seems to be some hints in the text that the wedding supper is on the earth when the kingdom is set up, is set up on the earth. The marriage has already taken place by then. It's celebrated in the supper, apparently. Then, of course, the second coming of Christ, and then the Davidic kingdom is established. Let's diagram this another way. If we look at time... We, we are in that interval of Daniel 9.25. Well, actually, yeah, 9.26, I should say. The interval, uh, yeah, 9.26. I've got to correct this diagram here. Um, that then we encounter the 70th week, which is uh, the seven-year period. The Harpazo takes place sometime prior to that 70th week. Why? Because the 70 weeks is defined by a treaty that the Antichrist uh, enforces, a covenant that he enforces, and he rises to power after the Habatso, according to Second Thessalonians 2. By some distance, is it a day, is it 30 years, who knows. But the main point I want to focus on here, not what's going on on the earth here, we have the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat as it's called, and the marriage of the Lamb. On the earth, meanwhile, of course, we got this seven year enforcement by the world leader. We have it being violated in the middle of that seven years, the abomination of desolation. 
And the two halves of that week are the most documented periods of time in both the Old and New Testament. Three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days in each case. But okay, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, oh, and of course, the great tribulation is not seven years, it's three and a half. It's, you know, Jesus himself labels it the last half of that seven year period. But that climax is in Armageddon, which then is interrupted by the second coming. So prior to that second coming, we have two events apparently taking place already in heaven. Bema seed of, the Bema seed of Christ, marriage of the Lamb. That, when he, sets, he comes back, he sets up his kingdom for how long? For a thousand years. In fact, the first thing that happens as, when he's back on the earth is the sheep and goat judgment. The more you study it, the stranger it is. It's mortals being condemned to hell on a basis of works. Strange. You want to understand what that's really all about? I won't take the time here to get into that here. Then there's the marriage supper celebrating the, the, the marriage. There, is, there are two periods, 1290 days and 1335. There's a total of 75 days, uh, 30 and 45, that are a mystery. Many people speculate. No one's sure. The nearer we can find out. But it's, it's clear that there's some very important timings issuing there. After he gets back, but before some of these other things get started. And at the end of the thousand years, we have the great white throne. That's the final big one, if you will. That's after a thousand years. And it's at, after the great white throne that we have a new heavens as well as a new earth. A new heavens as well as a new earth. Satan has had access to heaven. Heaven's due for a refurbishing. And that's also when we have the new Jerusalem, the strange structure that apparently comes down and hovers over the earth that may represent the commingling then of the wife of Yotevah and the bride of Christ. Okay. Now, the judgments. The Bema seat, we've mentioned that one. If the authorizing verse is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. That's where rewards are administered. Crowns and assignments and, and what have you. That's where the kingdom parables focus on, the talents, the virgins, the uninvited guests, and so forth. That's also the call of the bride to the marriage of the Lamb. The bride of Messiah, in contrast to the adulterous wife of Yorhevav, which of course is an allusion to Israel. The sheep and goat judgment, that's the first thing that happens after he gets back, and that's on the earth. There's three parties involved, the sheep and the goats and my brethren. We need to understand what that's really all about, another study. But mortals are judged on the basis of works. Very strange. You want to study that carefully. Great white throne, which I assume none of us are going to be involved in. Right? And that's at the end of the millennium. And that's, we have the new heavens, new earth, and so on. The Bema Seed. That's the one that we need to focus on. That's what the epistle of Hebrews is really uh, dwelling on. The Bema Seed. Now, this is not... A, the, you get people teaching that the Bema Seed is where the athletes got their rewards... It's not a place of judgment. That's not true. It is true that that's what's going to be the role here. But the Bema seat, the word in Greek, that's what Pilate sat on when he judged Christ in Matthew 27, 19. That's what Herod was sitting on when he was smitten by worms in Acts 12. That's what Gallio, when he was sentencing Paul in Acts 18. And Festus, that's where he had his trial sentencing. The judgment seat, the Bema seat is a judgment seat. And this is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, indeed, everyone in, before this seat, according to 2 Corinthians 5.10, we're all saved. We're there to receive the rewards for our faithfulness. None of us are there because of our faithfulness. We're there because we've trusted Christ. We're there because of his faithfulness. Yet, he's, out to, he's there to hand out rewards. Let's talk about that in 1 Corinthians 3. Let's not speculate. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay stubble, there's two groups. Those that are not flammable, gold, silver, precious stones, and those that are flammable, wood, hay stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. It's not testing the man, it's testing his work. He's saved. And he'll make that clear here in a minute. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Devoutly to be wished, huh? If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. In other words, like a refugee. So if you're, sa if you're there, you're saved by Jesus Christ. What, you're in what you inherit 
will be a function of your inheritance, your faithfulness. Inheritances can be forfeit. In the Old Testament, inheritances can be forfeit in the New Testament. Important study. You need to take it on. If your work abides, you shall receive a reward. What kinds of reward? We'll talk about a few. But in any case, you're still saved because you're there because of what Christ did, not because of what you did. The Bema Seat. Let's map this a little bit. Let's m map faithfulness horizontally. 1 Corinthians 3, 11, 15, we've just read, okay? Now, there are those that have been overtaken and those that are overcomers. To the degree that you've been faithful, you are an overcomer. To the extent that you're saved, but you just haven't got it together, the world, the flesh, or the devil has had the best of you, so to speak. You, have, uh, you, you, you don't have any coupons in your book when you get there, okay? Now, the overcomers, boy, there's seven promises specifically in the book of Revelation, among other things. There's also, the carnal Christians are down over here on the left side. They're Christians, they're carnal Christians, but they're Christians. They're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Have they walked the walk? Apparently very poorly, if at all, right? Now, in between these, you've got five crowns promised. Five crowns. Let's take a look at those. You've got a crown of life. It mentioned two places, James 1 and Revelation 2. For those who have suffered for his sake. How many of you have suffered for Christ's sake? Great, okay, praise God, you've got a few. I think there'll be more of us before the next few years unfold. And that's a privilege. Most of us are going to have opportunities we can't even imagine. But praise God for those. This comfortable world that we've enjoyed for several generations is over for lots of reasons. And that's going to be good for the kingdom. Now, there's a crown of righteousness for those who loved His appearing. How many really love the appearing of Christ? You know, there are Christians that abhor the appearing. They, they, they are not in love with the, the, the coming of the Lord. And I, 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 I won't start on that one. But anyway, uh, for those who loved His appearing. Okay. The crown of glory, First Peter talks about. For those who feed the flock. Are you feeding the flock? You don't have to be publishing books or being on a platform to do that. The most powerful place you can do that is in your home, in small groups. And a crown incorruptible for those who press on steadfastly. Now, by the way, I personally don't think there are five crowns. Oh, there's one more here, isn't there? Five crowns. Crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. I, don't, I personally will be surprised if there's only five crowns. These are five that happen to be mentioned. They sort of overlap in my mind. I think there's probably dozens. Or maybe they're, and they're given for different reasons. But there are crowns. There's Stephanos there. These are not, the, the, you know, these are not diadems. They're Stephanos. And uh, they're, rewards, they're, they're rewards for works. And by the way, they're never promised angels. That's interesting. In Revelation, it summarizes it near the end. Behold, I come quickly, Jesus says. Hold that fast which thou hast, let that no man take thy crown. Let no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go, out, he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And, he's, and of course, that's one of the seven letters, seven churches, and I suspect that's uh, the letter to Sardis, I think, isn't it? Huh? Let no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall no more go out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him. Wow. Do I really know what each one of those things mean? No. But it sure sounds good, doesn't it? No, you have a pretty good idea what he's talking about. Overcomers, seven. The eat of the tree of life, not heard of the second death, hidden manna, a white stone, new name given, power over the nations, white raiment assured, pillar new name, yeah, it was Revelation 3.12, sit with Christ on his throne, they shall inherit all things. That is in Revelation 21. That's the overcomer. Are you an overcomer? Have you been faithful? Behavior matters. There are 12 judgments. Okay, gee, if that's what's happening, what do we need to do? Well, how are we going to be judged? By how we treat other believers. 
That's all through the scripture. How do you treat other believers? How do we exercise our authority over others in general? How we employ our God-given abilities. How we use our money. Yes, that's there too, all through the scripture. How we spend our time. That's probably even more important than our money. What are your priorities? Where do you spend your time? How much we suffer for Jesus. That's a privilege. And it's well rewarded. How we run that particular race which God has chosen for us. Every one of us is in a slightly different race. You get your challenge to discover what race you're in and run it faithfully. How effectively we control the old nature. Boy, that's a challenge. How many souls we witness to and win to Christ. I don't like the idea of winning to Christ. The Holy Spirit does that. But you understand what it's saying. Yeah. How we react to temptation. Boy, how much the doctrine of the rapture means to us. The doctrine of the rapture is one of the yardsticks that's going to emerge at the Bema seat. 2 Timothy 4, verses 8 and 9. Check it out. How faithful we are to the word of God and to the flock of God. And that's all through the scripture. You can get these from the notes. The Bema seat. We have overtaken people, overcomers. We have carnal Christians on the left. We have five crowns, among other things, awarded. There's one thing left to talk about, or at least suggest, that's the bride. Is the bride of Christ and the body of Christ synonymous? Some people, many good scholars, take that for granted. There are some scholars that think there's a distinction here that the bride is the faithful subset. They're the ones that wear their own raiment at the festivities. Raiment being... The, the, the badge of their faithfulness, not the imputed faithfulness of Christ, which all of us would have to have to be anywhere. And the bride is, is uh, th thus, uh, it, it, it's a, they argue that a bride is always taken out of, the, out of his body. The most, it's just the most intimate subset of the body. That's certainly true of Eve taken out of Adam. When Eliezer is, t t is assigned by Abraham to get a bride for Isaac, he insists that they go, she's called out from their own people. And it's interesting that he takes with him ten camels. I think that may be a linkage to the ten virgins, by the way. But anyway, she's always seen arrayed in her own raiment. That could be very significant. So that's a possibility. I, I throw it out for you to do your own study. But I want to throw some caveats and we'll wrap it up here. Apply the Berean doctrine, Acts 17, 11. Search the scriptures. Receive the word with all openness of mind. Step one. Step two, check it out for yourself. Come to your own conclusions from your own study. Remember, you're not under the law. The Messiah is the fulfillment of the Torah. As Matthew 5.17 declares, and also the entire epistle of Hebrews is hammers away all through it from end to end. At the same time, I'm going to suggest you avoid a works trip. Don't make a list of the things you're going to do for Christ. You'd be led by the Spirit. The stuff that you do, no matter how noteworthy it might be, if it's of the flesh, it doesn't count. You need to walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. That's what the epistle of the Galatians is all about. And if you want a place to go after Hebrews, assuming you've been through Romans, your next step is to go through Galatians. Then you'll have the Trinity Paul wrote. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? The book of Romans. How shall they live? The book of Galatians. By faith, the book of Hebrews. The three are a trilogy written by Paul and structured as accordingly. Remember that you, are, you do not need to sin. Sin should not be reigning in your life anymore. That's what the Holy Spirit is a resource you can call upon. Romans 6 hammers that for you. If you're going to walk with the Lord, you don't fall behind. You don't get ahead of Him. The challenge is to take it step by step. He doesn't necessarily give you a flash of vision of where you're going to be 10 years from now. He will illuminate your step one step at a time. That's His style. That's part of the faith is taking that step one step at a time. Don't, and Hebrews 4 dealt with that. Okay, in our final, and I should say, our next session will be in Hebrews 13. When you read Hebrews 13, the question you want to be thinking about, beside reviewing your notes about the whole package, is does it have a happy ending? And I have a surprise for you when we get there. The session after that will be our last session. I'm going to append to this whole series a review uh, that will have some surprises for you that affect all of these things from out, out of primarily Luke 21. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.